on, on where we are um, for the moment regarding uh, the Brexit discussions or negotiations or call it whatever you want. Uh, but it's uh, where, where we are for the moment. And then we just open the floor. Uh, we received quite some questions, so we'll, we'll take them uh, as, as we go along. Uh, there will be questions uh, that will be dealt with on P&O. There will be questions on VAT. There will be questions of customs in international trade, and and based on the on the feedback of the first version and the question that we could not uh, answer the first time, uh, there were there were also questions on IT. So we we, we requested Mark uh, Mark Hussels to be with us uh, today, but uh, I'll present the, the people in a minute. So thanks a lot for. Uh, uh, for for joining, um, my name is Lionel. Um, I'm going to kick off the, uh, uh, the 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 session with you guys, uh, and we'll we'll hold you uh, we'll we'll hold you for the the first ten minutes regarding the the status and where we are with uh, with the discussions on Brexit. Maybe uh, Ingrid, if we could uh, go to the uh, to the next uh, slides. So three three parts. I said that. Oops, sorry. Three parts. I said that the 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 the, the very last deadline. Then the the huge session on, around Q and A, uh, the huge session around Q and A, and then uh, of course the Brexit readiness. Um, that's something that we will also briefly touch upon. So where do we stand on Brexit? Um, I'm very honest with you. Uh, that's exactly the same slides we presented like a few weeks ago. Um, I'm not quite sure that actually we we get any further in the discussion, or at least officially. Uh, but if we could, if we walk down memory lane. On the 23rd of June 2016, 2016, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that whole Brexit discussion, soap opera, season, series, whatever you want to call it, uh, started. So it's we are season four of, of Brexit. So with Claire, uh, we are already on season four of Brexit, and that even isn't started. So that's 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 wonderful, right? So it's a it's a TV show that hasn't started, but we are already uh, at season four. Uh, so that's that's quite interesting. And if I if I do a parallel with with my own life, by the time Brexit started, I almost got three kids. <laughs> so so honestly, uh, one warm call to to Boris Johnson and and and, and, and President Van der Leyen, please do finalize this because actually we already have four kids and I cannot take any more any more of these kids. So stop discussing and let's let's hit the road with Brexit because we are full house here at my home. So that would be good. Uh, so uh, we we have been productive on the Van Reed family uh, with with the kids a bit more than than the negotiation, if I may. Um, we are they are still discussing. There are voices from the EU uh, Parliament uh, in Strasbourg that that comes and say, yeah, that's going to be a, a Brexit. Uh, if there is an, if there is an FTA, that's going to be imposed to us, and there is no way we can do uh, we can do a work by having a veto, by having a discussion, and so on and so forth. So we need uh, we need to have the time to discuss, and to translate, and to 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 vote on this, and we just don't have materially the time to do that. So. Do we get a, a full FTA like the one we know for, like, uh, for Japan or Canada and stuff of the like? I think that we obviously have to be very honest with ourselves. I don't think so. Uh, a full FTA, it's very, it's likely unlikely. It's very uh, likely unlikely to to happen. Why? Because we just don't have time for that. And normally, you you take on average seven years to to, to discuss with that. So so technically, you can you can always argue, okay, that's four years. Uh, that's what you said, Lionel. Uh, yes, that's what I said. But honestly, uh, it's uh, it's it, we are far from from having all the uh, the, the elements dealt with uh, in in a full comprehensive FTA. That's that's not there for the moment. So that's one. Second uh, is uh, agreement on certain elements, certain fields. Uh, that that could be that could be an option. Honestly, that could be an option. We see that the fishery is still a really a, a, a really a, a blockage, a, a no-go, showstopper, whatever you want to call it. Uh, this point, and that's true. Um, we saw the the image. Can you imagine if uh, if uh, the, the the military forces goes into a North Sea in order to block uh, Belgian, Dutch, French uh, fishermen? That's gonna that's gonna be tense. Uh, so. Uh, I, Agreement on certain uh, certain elements that might be a possibility, and then we we go on with with that. And there are questions on the import duties on certain uh, certain sectors, so we'll come back to that. But it's it's a uh, it's it's indeed uh, it's indeed a possibility. Uh, that could be a possibility to 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 have that deal and to sign it, to vote it, and then has it applicable as from first of January 
or as other people are saying, certain commissioners are saying, that could be certain uh, politicians are saying, that could be the start of saying, well, you, you see, we, 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 went to, we went on an agreement on certain elements of that FTA, give us more time, and we deliver a full FTA. And then, bam, enlarge the transition period. Honestly, I don't think so, but you never know. It's a, it's a, at the end of the day, it might be a political decision. The no deal Brexit, no deal Brexit. That's what I said last time. I think that uh, before it was, it was every, a lot of people were stressed about that one uh, on the Brexit, uh, no deal. Honestly, that cliff edge scenario. A lot of uh, our clients uh, are, are saying that actually they are, they are, they do not, they are not afraid of that. They are not afraid anymore because they are prepared. And so you know what? Let it come. So it's a, uh, it's something that it's a, uh, it's uh, that it's. Uh, that, that people have integrated and they, they have learned to live with. So technically now we, we rather have the, the, the reaction of people saying, you know what, bring it bring it on, bring in bring in the Brexit. We are we are ready, let's let's go for that because it's it's not something that we wanted to have, but it's imposed on us. But okay, let's let's make the best out of it. So that's 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 also a, a an important point. And then last but not least, as I said, uh, the last minute political twist what could that give? Uh, as I said in option two, that could give an extra time to negotiate. Unlikely, but you never know. I mean, it's a political decision after all. So, uh, uh, or just push push back the date once again. But uh, I mean, we are, we are, it's totally crazy. If you look at, uh, at the calendar, we are the 16th of December, ladies and gentlemen, 16th of December, and there are still some, some uncertainties around along the road. So I think that Wow, if for that political twist to, to happen better now than actually let uh, do, that wait 10 extra days. So that's for, for me uh, a bit what we, what is really important. So that's that's a bit where we stand on where we stand on Brexit. Uh, Ingrid, before I give you the word to moderate and uh, to launch a question, can you go back just one slide? Uh, go back maybe one slide so that so that uh, everybody that uh, don't can see the 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 ah, well, who we have with us. Uh, so uh, with us, uh, you have uh, Claire, uh, she will present herself, uh, she's uh, co-leading the Brexit initiative with me, uh, and she, she, will, uh, she will be uh, also uh, discussing VAT customs with me, so that's, that's, uh, uh, that's for her part. Uh, Nadia, very well known in all the Brexit, uh, as well, uh, leading our, our efforts uh, regarding p &O. Uh, she will take uh, some of your questions uh, uh, that were that were raised uh, to her, and also the the others that will come in that will come in, in the chat. Uh, Mark will take um, uh, everything that has to do with IT, uh, SAP, or other likes. So that that's uh, that's is uh, it's it's treasure. That's what he likes to do. So that he will he will uh, give it to me, and then uh, we could not do that uh, without Ingrid. Uh, so Ingrid is there to, not to only to help, but also to take on uh, questions. So that's uh, that's good. So that's the team for for you today. Uh, if we go back uh, to 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 the slide deck, um, we had the status uh, before I give the word to you, Ingrid. I think that there was still one one slide. Uh, very often, uh, people needs to think about a few things. And as I said last time, these are the questions that we ask we, normally in the surveys. When Brexit comes, will you lodge your own customs declaration? Also that. Or you never done a uh, custom declaration. If you are one, and of course you are in one of these three uh, category. So if you ask yourself the question, is that correct? Is that covered? Yes, no. Absolutely sure. Yes or no. Is your customs broker, logistic partner, has has this uh, enough uh, enough uh, uh, space in order to do that? Of course. Then uh, speaking of devil, the D-Day, uh, are you ready? You're still busy. You're busy, but actually you were delayed by COVID or just not even started. Uh, honestly, don't be ashamed. Uh, more than 20% uh, do uh, confess that they haven't started. That's that's a bit what comes out of all the, the session we're doing. Uh, was busy, but COVID has blocked us around 25%. So if you take those two together, it's 45% of people that says, I, I wish I would be I would be a bit further <laughs> in my preparation, but uh, we'll we'll keep that for 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 the last uh, the last minutes of the slides. Uh, there is still hope at the end of the tunnel. Uh, if they have taken four, four, four years to bring them where they are now in the negotiation, I think that in a few weeks you can do, you can do miracles. Uh, so that's uh, that's my take. Me in the UK, uh, just think about what you are doing with the UK. You're selling, you're buying, you're purchasing, uh, you're, you're manufacturing, sorry. You're doing both. You're doing neither. Uh, only services. 
this is really needed uh, in order to know what uh, what will really impact on your activity. And then the border or operating model, uh, that's a bit more uh, my garden. It's a it's a it's a decoration model in the in the UK that has been published by the UK. A nice uh, bedtime story of more than two hundred pages. Uh, if you import in the in the UK, that's something that you absolutely need to go through. Well, uh, I think that without further ado, uh, maybe uh, give the word to you, uh, Ingrid, so that you can uh, you can moderate. Uh, Greet the at school, still on mute so that you know. Or do you want me? That's the okay. Uh, I'll if your voice is not going through, uh, I can uh, definitely uh, do it. Um, if you can switch the slides, uh, I think that uh, the first host uh, guest that we have uh, is is. Um, is on you, uh, Nadia. If I can give you the word, uh, you you were uh, provided with some questions from the audience, so don't uh, don't hesitate to uh, to take them uh, in the order that you want. If you could re read them out loud and then uh, and then get the uh, get the uh, the answer to them, that would be that would be awesome. Okay, um, welcome from my part as well to everybody. Um, there's a few questions that are people related, uh, or we'll see that there are far more VAT and customs related questions. Um, so I'll start with uh, a first one, which is what will happen with the new A1 documents that would be needed? Um, so the A1 documents is actually related to the social security position of people. Um, and this is something that has been dealt with in the withdrawal agreement. So those people who are beneficiaries of the withdrawal agreement, so they are in a cross-border situation before the end of this year and continue to do so afterwards, they will still be governed, uh, their social security position uh, will be governed still by an EU regulation in this respect. It is based on that regulation that A1 documents proving an attestation from the uh, authorities where you're subject to social security is being issued. And for those people who will continue to be in such a situation, A1s will still be delivered both by European countries and the UK. Also, if those people switches situations but are still considered to be beneficiaries of the withdrawal agreement, A1s are still going to be issued. Now, for people who come in a cross-border situation after the 1st of January uh, 2021, it's at the moment uh, where we stand now, it will be domestic legislation of the different countries that will become applicable unless there is a bilateral treaty between the UK and that specific country. And so there will be no A1s anymore because those people will not be governed by the uh, EU regulation anymore. And there it has to be seen on a case by case basis, whether there's a specific other kind of uh, document that can prove social security position or if that is not available at all. Um, for Belgium, we do have a bilateral treaty with the UK, but um, at this moment, the political stance is that it is not going to come into force, uh, which means that for Belgian domestic legislation, we don't have specific documents and it will be uh, have to be looked at domestic legislation, whether a person becomes subject to Belgian social security or whether a person can remain subject to Belgian social security. Another question uh, that was uh, that came in is what is the process for people traveling into the UK for work after settled status closes? Um, it's 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 uh, I'm not quite sure where uh, the person who asked the question once uh, is looking for. The settled status process in the UK is actually a process, again, for people who are beneficiaries of the withdrawal agreement, but from an immigration perspective. People who have been living and working in the UK by the end of this year and continue to work and do so. Once they have that settled status, they are still free to travel back and forth uh, to the UK. If it is people that start their position after the 1st of January 2021, 
then uh, you will have to look at what they will do uh, and whether they will need certain immigration documents in the UK. But that will be a case to case uh, yeah, analysis that needs to be done, much the same as you would have to do for any other third country national traveling to the UK. Um, then I have a question, and I think that that's um, if there is anybody uh, here that has a UK driver's license. Uh, the question is, will people with a UK driver's license still be able to drive in Belgium? Um, and there has been some publication recently uh, also by uh, on the mobility websites uh, of Belgium. In the sense that a British driving license, when you live in Belgium, it is clearly recommended to have it exchanged into a Belgian license because after the 1st of January you will have to have uh, a Belgian license and if you can do so before the end of this year then it's a quite simple procedure if you will do it as of next year it will still be possible but it will take uh, a longer time because there's there's a, a slightly different procedure uh, to be handled and in the meantime while the uh, driving license is exchanged, you're not allowed to drive. And you have to uh, give up your uh, UK driver's license uh, once you have your Belgian driver's license. If you deregister from Belgium, you will get back your uh, um, British driving license. As a tourist, you are able to drive with a with a, a British driving license, but you can only do so for a, a limited period of time, being 185 days uh, after that. And or once you are registered and you're no longer a tourist, then you will have to exchange the driver's license. So a very practical one. Another practical one is there. Uh, deadline to request a new residence cards m or n cards um this m or n card this is uh the belgian card that uh will yeah will prove that you are a beneficiary of the withdrawal agreement for immigration purposes meaning that with uh based on that card you are able to live and work in belgium the m card is for uh residents in belgium the n card is for fronty workers um you will have until the end of december uh 2021 to actually uh exchange the card and during the exchange procedure you will get a kind of uh attestation that you're still in that process the royal decree of when you can start exchanging your current uh, residence cards into these M and N cards is still not uh, published. The legislation is published, but the royal decree uh, with all the practical details uh, is not published yet. So we are awaiting that and we think that should be there any, any time soon now. Uh, a last question is, do I need a work permit as a frontier worker? Coming into Belgium, um, that's, uh, yeah, that, there's, a, there's a difference. Um, if you are a frontier worker currently, but you have a UK uh, employment contract, then um, at this moment they are considering this or they, they will have to look at whether you do that uh, in order to provide services. So if your stay and work in Belgium is based on the free provision of services and not the free, pro, uh, free movement of employees. And in, uh, in such case, you will need a work permit as of the 1st of January 2021, even if you're doing that work already now, because you're not considered a beneficiary of the withdrawal agreement. If you have a Belgian employment uh, agreement, then you will be eligible for this uh, end card I was just talking about. And then we uh, had a, a very specific question on uh, a project uh, project related work in the UK, but this we will take uh, offline separately because it is really a, a detailed UK immigration question. And then I hand over back to you, uh, Ingrid or Leo. Uh, Nadia, a question because I, I received that from a lot of uh, uh, clients and ourselves. If, if after first of uh, of Jan, we need to go uh, to the UK for meetings and then stay two three days. Uh, I mean, if we don't stay longer 
at a certain period with our with our passport, we we can go, right? Uh, or, or yes. Like, yes, and no. <laughs> yes and no. It will depend on what you will do, uh, because business meetings is such such a, a large uh, encompassing term that can be used for 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 a lot of things. You will have to look at what you're actually going to do in the UK is exempted from uh, from visa requirements. Um, if it is really what they consider as business uh, meetings, business relations, then. It is uh, you are free, you don't have to have uh, a specific business visa because you are exempted. But it really depends on the activities that you will uh, that you will go perform there. Okay. The, so, so to be checked. Okay. So so it's 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 rather I'm not going to say a case by case, but that could be something like okay, guys, uh, it's not just a given that you go with your passport and you can do whatever you like. I mean, it's, uh, there are rules that need to be obeyed and, and observed, and, and people need to think if it's only a meeting, then like you said, probably no problem. Uh, but actually, if that meeting entails and then you need to sign some papers and then buy some grounds over there, blah, 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 start to do that, just make sure that actually this is all permissible with your, with your, your uh, file, without visa. Yeah. Okay. And also the other way around for UK nationals traveling into Europe, they will have to look at the national legislation of the countries concerned, whether they are exempted from any work permit requirements. At just the travel, there's a visa exemption for up to up to uh, three months, but it does not mean that you're allowed to work. So depending on what you're going to do during your business travel, uh, there might be some uh, administration that you need to have uh, done up front. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot uh, uh, for the people. People don't know that, but Ingrid tries desperately to uh, to come to the world. But actually, she has two profile, and one is uh, muted, and that's apparently the one we need in order to get uh, to hear her voice. So uh, I'll I'll just uh, I'll just uh, uh, moderate while we are uh, while we are advancing in the uh, in the discussion. So thanks a lot, Nadia, guys, uh, in the uh, in the chat. If you have some questions. Uh, don't hesitate to shoot them to Nadia. Uh, Nadia is your, your contact person for everything that has to do with people and mobility. So if you uh, if you have, still have some questions or or you just joined, uh, don't hesitate to uh, uh, to um, uh, to shoot your question. That's the purpose of this session. So um, okay, thanks a lot, Nadia. As always, very clear and and thanks, uh, Claire. Um, hopefully, you are not muted. Uh, and Claire, if you could, uh, if I can pass it on to to you, uh, there were a lot of questions on VAT, and as we go along, I think that actually in the beginning of the Brexit, Claire, uh, we we saw a lot of questions on customs. That's true. Yep. And now we see we see actually everybody start to realize that oui, we may have to put our VAT house in in into in order before we go we move to the Brexit situation. So can you guide us through uh, all the questions that we received there? Yes, of course. Thank you, Leo. Um, so indeed, we re received a lot of questions regarding VAT. Now we try to bundle uh, the questions a little bit per topic. So uh, UK import VAT. Uh, what about export out of the United Kingdom? And then uh, a very hot one currently is trading from and to Northern Ireland. Um, the use of VAT simplifications. Interested? Year end rebates, what about e commerce? And although indeed most of the changes in respect of Brexit relate to the supply of goods, there is also services which may be impacted and uh, last but not least, some refunds as well. Um, so I'm going to kick off with those questions now. Uh, saying that to the extent you would have any further questions during the session, please do share them in the chat function. So first, if we kick off with UK import VAT. Um, so there, the first question we received is what is actually the VAT treatment when goods are imported from the European Union to the United Kingdom? So indeed, as from uh, the 1st of January, which will be end of the transition period, goods will have to actually be imported into the United Kingdom. So that will no longer be an intra-community acquisition. 
The first question in that respect uh, is who will act as importer of record? Will that be you as a Belgian supplier or will you ask your customer to do that? Uh, so you can freely decide upon who will act as importer of record. But of course, you will need to take into account the VAT and the customs consequences in that respect. Um, I will later on touch upon the link between the INCO terms and who can act as importer of record. Um, now, to the extent the goods are imported into the United Kingdom, of course, UK import VAT will become due and UK import duties will become due. As regarding the UK import VAT, there it is clear, HMRC has clearly confirmed that, that they foresee in a reverse charge mechanism. So, in fact, you will not be liable to pay the UK import VAT upon arrival of the goods and clearance of the goods in the UK, but you can actually defer that to your uh, UK VAT return. So upon arrival of the goods, you do not need to pay the VAT to the uh, customs authorities, but you can actually defer it. And you then need, of course, to report the UK VAT as payable VAT and as deductible VAT in your UK VAT return. Um, here in Belgium, we have a similar system. You may know it as the so-called ET14000 license. A big difference with the UK is that here in Belgium, if you want to apply that um, deferment scheme, you actually need to file an application for that. So you actually need to uh, apply for such a license. That is not the case in the United Kingdom. So you do not need to apply for such a, uh, a license. You can just um, report the VAT as VAT due in your UK VAT return and deduct it at the same time. Which, what is crucial, however, is that you clearly inform your UK customs broker that you will be using that simplification so that he's aware that upon actual importation of the goods into the United Kingdom, you, he will not have to uh, pay the import VAT because you are going to defer that import VAT to your UK VAT return. Now, this system, which I just described, is the so-called VAT postponed accounting system. Yeah, um, And once again, you can apply it. You do not need to uh, ask for an authorization in that respect. What is also, and maybe Leo, uh, you can you can uh, further elaborate on that a little bit later, is the fact that the UK has foreseen in a kind of transition um, scheme whereby upon actual importation into the United Kingdom, you will not be liable to lodge an import declaration immediately, but you can postpone it until six months later. So at the latest, by the 1st of July, you should have your, your uh, actual import declaration has to be drawn up. So also in this, this respect, this is something you need to agree upon with your customs broker, whether upon arrival of the goods, he will actually lodge an import declaration or whether he will, you would like to make use of that postponement for a period of six months. Do note that if uh, you're going to use that postponement of six months, that at the actual moment of importation into the UK, you will not be liable to pay any import duties, but once again, please, Leo, uh, intervene. Um, so you will not need to pay any import duties at that time, that those import duties will only have to be paid upon the time that you actually uh, will lodge the import declaration in the United Kingdom. That system has no impact on your UK import VAT, so that UK import VAT remains due upon the actual arrival of the goods in the UK. So even if you agree with your customs broker not to lodge that uh, customs declaration immediately, even then you need to pay that UK import VAT, whereby we advise our clients to make use of that UK uh, deferment, whereby you can actually pay that UK import VAT, not upon importation, but through your UK VAT return. Okay. 
Um, Leo, do you want to add something regarding the, the, the importation or, or well, shall I continue with? Uh... Uh, 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 we, we had a few questions, uh, Claire, on, on, uh, on the border operating model. And then uh, I see a gentleman also asking a question on the import document number before you ship uh, through Calais. So I, I'll try to bundle that. Uh, I'll try to bundle that all together uh, when I'm, I'm tackling import, if that's if that's OK. For OK, you. perfect. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Um, now, one important thing uh, to remember here is, as I just stated, as from the 1st of January 2021, of course, no longer intra-community acquisitions, the arrival of the goods will qualify as importations. However, HMRC still requires you to file UK arrival interest at returns. Which is kind of strange because we, within the European Union, of course, we are used in only declaring intra-community movements on our uh, interest set returns. Uh, so when you supply goods from Belgium to the UK, you will not declare that shipment in your Belgian uh, interest return departure side. But if you act as importer of record in the UK, you will be liable to file a UK arrival interest at return. So this is something to take uh, care of, of course, when you are actually setting up your ERP system. Uh, I think later on, or or maybe now, it whatever he prefers, my colleague Mark Hussels uh, will also further touch upon this point. Okay. Um, some questions regarding the relevance of INCO terms, uh, because as I stated, who can act as importer of record? Well, you as a, a Belgian supplier, you can act as, uh, as uh, importer of record, but also the, 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 the client can act as importer of record, your UK client. Now, the INCO terms uh, may indicate or, or can be in an element to determine who actually will act as importer of record. So, for example, if you're supplying DDP towards your uh, customers in the UK, then in principle, because you're supplying delivery duty paid, you as a Belgian supplier should act as importer of record in the UK. However, once again, an INCO term is merely an indication of who should act as uh, importer of record. Uh, you are not legally bound to, to act upon that. Um, then, um, so for UK import VAT, there I think I've covered it all. Now, one final question. Can we send an order directly from a Belgium EDC, so European Distribution Center, to UK customer without having to pass through UK DC first? Yes, you can. Of course, uh, there is no obligation whatsoever to pass through uh, a, a UK uh, DC first, so you can perfectly send your goods directly, direct shipment from Belgium to your UK customer. But once again, it will have to be decided upon who will act as importer of record in that respect. Yeah. Claire, here may be a, a, an add-on uh, to, to that question. I found it, this question interesting because we, we, we got that one uh, uh, several times already. Uh, to what Claire is saying, if you send directly to your DC, it might be so that depending on where that DC is located, you have to use, let's say, a less known port than Felix Tau or Dover. So just uh, read through this uh, because there are some uh, information that has been shared with the, the most important entry points in the UK and exit points in the UK. But this is really important. A lot of these customs offices at entry of smaller ports, they have not received the same level of information. So it might be so that if you if you ship directly to, to your location, which is which is fine from a tax perspective, operations perspective, please bear in mind that you may encounter um, <laughs> A more practical or concrete solution that needs to be found out on that very day, because these guys uh, on that uh, on that entry point they might just not have the same level of information automation that actually others. So keep that in mind. I know it's it's not it's not funny. We don't like that either. But it's better to know that that 
If you ship directly, make sure that 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 line that line is covered and is secured, and just don't go uh, just don't, don't don't go in the in the in the wild adventure, uh, thinking that okay, yeah, Dover and Felix Tau is in order, so all the other entry points will be in order. That's not the that not, not the signal that we receive from the, from the market for the moment. So I just wanted to uh, to, to pinpoint that. So keep that in mind uh, if, if you do that. But je- please do send it right away to the DC. That's perfectly possible. Keep that in mind that from an operation point of view, we may just have to uh, uh, to be just uh, you know a, b- a bit prudent in there or anticipate. Okay. Thank you very much, Leo. Um... Maybe uh, some two follow-up questions who just came in. So do we already have an import duties list per HS code? Yes, that was published by HMRC. You, so you can find the import duties uh, which will be applied by the UK on the HMRC website. Uh, so this is, uh, you can easily retrieve there the import duty which will be applicable to your products on uh, the HMRC website. Now, of course, you need to take into account that it is not only the import duties which will need to be paid, but you will also need to pay your customs broker uh, a fee for drafting those import and uh, export declarations. So, um, in that respect, if if somebody would be interested, um, we have developed a tool uh, whereby, in fact, on the basis of your interest at declaration, because currently you are declaring, already declaring all the movements of goods between Belgium and the UK in your interest at return, and purely on the basis of your interest at return data, uh, we can easily... um, give you a first impression on what will be the import duties so what will be the actual cost of your of the import duties and what will be the actual compliance cost so that you can easily see well which products will be hit the most uh which clients will be hit the most etc um okay voila and leo already has put the uh, link whereby you can actually find the tariffs on the chat function. Then a more practical question, the question was raised, will this be recorded? Yes, this session will be recorded. Um, Then I'm just looking, scrolling to the questions. I think that for um, the UK import VAT side, that covers it all. Then we move to exporting out of the UK. So the first questions related to the importation of goods into the UK, whereby these questions now more relate to the exportation out of the UK. First, so the, the question there was, we are receiving orders coming from the United Kingdom on a weekly basis. Will they charge us additional costs for the import in Belgium or export out of the UK? Well, That depends on your agreement, of course. Uh, It is clear that it will be more expensive uh, because currently, if the goods are shipped from the United Kingdom to Belgium, intra-community transaction, no uh, customs declarations to be prepared or filed, no import duties. As from the 1st of January, there will be the obligation for an export declaration in the UK and an import declaration into Belgium. The question now raises, who will pay for those extra costs? Um, What is foreseen in your uh, agreement with your supplier? Because we already assisted a lot of clients in that respect and some underlying agreements merely foresee, well, look, this is a fixed price. And even if there would be extra charges, the extra charges remain the responsibility of of the supplier. Or is there an opening in your agreement whereby the supplier can own charge these extra costs towards you as a client? So in that respect, you this is not I, I cannot give you an answer which will fit to all the situation. You clearly have to review the underlying agreement, what you have with your uh, supplier in that respect. And that, of course, not only relates to the actual um, compliance costs relating to the drafting of those import and export declaration, but the same, of course, goes to the actual duties which will have to be paid. 
So even if your UK supplier would act as importer of record in Belgium, so he would in principle be liable then to pay those import duties, does he has, is there a, a clause in the underlying agreement which foresees that he can actually increase his price as a result of those import duties he will need to be, he will need to pay? Of course, we are now 16 December. If there would be free trade agreement uh, agreed upon before the end of uh, of this calendar year, it might still be possible that there are no import duties to be paid. But please be reminded that even if there would be a free trade agreement, the import duties will, uh, of course, be, be 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 zero. But the compliance cost will not disappear. And that's, this is something we, we often hear is that people think that, well, if there will be a free trade agreement, Brexit will in fact go away because we will not have to pay import duties, correct? But you will always have to pay the compliance cost related to uh, the drafting and the lodging of those import and export declarations. Yeah. Just checking further questions. No. Um, then, yeah, then there are some questions coming in already regarding Northern Ireland. And there we are, Northern Ireland. So, um, Northern Ireland, as you know, um, everything, all the transactions with Northern Ireland are in fact governed by the so-called Northern Ireland Protocol. And that Northern Ireland Protocol means that Northern Ireland maintains complete alignment with the EU VAT rules for goods. So this is the first condition. Yeah? If you have any transactions with Northern Ireland, the EU VAT rules will still be applicable to the extent that you are supplying goods. So only in that respect, there is that alignment. The alignment includes goods moving to, from, or within Northern Ireland. Yeah. So on those movements, the EU VAT rules are applicable, however, Pay also attention that Northern Ireland is and will remain part of the UK VAT system. Yeah. So um, what does that now entail in practice? So let's say that you are a Belgian company and you are supplying goods from Belgium to a customer established in Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is still part of the UK VAT system. So that entails that the company which is established in Northern Ireland, they will currently have a GB VAT number. If you as a Belgian company will supply goods directly from Belgium to Northern Ireland, so to your customer which is established over there, as from the 1st of January 2021, you can only exempt that intra-community supply because you, at that time, you are performing an intra-community supply because Northern Ireland still will be aligned with the EU VAT rules. So you will perform an intra-community supply in Belgium. You can only invoke the exemption which is foreseen as regarding the intra-community supply to the extent that your client provides you with a valid you, uh, valid EU VAT number. A company which is established in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland, which is effectively part of the United Kingdom, will have a GB VAT number. So to the extent that your Northern Ireland client would provide you with that GB VAT number, you cannot invoke the VAT exemption. That entails that you in principle should uh, issue an invoice with application of Belgian VAT. Now, to overcome that issue, the Commission, in agreement, of course, with the United Kingdom, um, came up with a specific Northern Irish VAT number. You may already have heard about it. That is the specific VAT number, which starts with the prefix XI. Now, that will not be a separate 
well, it will be a separate VAT number, but you do not need to apply for that separate VAT number. So in my example, the client which is established in Northern Ireland and who has that uh, GB, who currently holds that GB VAT number, will then need to inform the, uh, the uh, UK authorities that he's doing business with EU suppliers and that he wants to activate its XI VAT number as well. Your XI VAT number, you can activate it also on the website of uh, HMRC and maybe Ingrid or, or somebody else um, can, can share the link to the website of HMRC whereby you can actually um, activate that number. So this is crucial, whereby in the beginning um, it was not clear whether any uh, further compliance obligations were to adhere to. Now, I think it was last week that HMRC clearly published uh, a link on its website whereby they clearly say, well, look, you need to um, actually inform us if you're trading with the uh, EU uh, suppliers so that you can activate that number. Okay, um, so this is, is, is the most Im important one. So, and then if we actually move to the questions in that respect, is that we often see in my first example, we started from an example whereby you will be supplying the goods directly from Europe to Northern Ireland. Um, th that is of course possible, but what we often see when we are assisting clients with um, establishing the, the or, or, or getting a better grip on the uh, VAT implications of trading with Northern Ireland after the Brexit is that the goods are not supplied directly from Belgium to Northern Ireland, but that they are in fact supplied over uh, Great Britain. So that there is no specific uh, line directly to your customers in Northern Ireland, but that you ship your goods from Belgium to a port in Great Britain and then from Great Britain onwards to Northern Ireland. Um, in that respect, and that was only published uh, yesterday, finally HMRC has also published on their website that indeed in that respect the normal transit procedure can still be applied. So upon arrival of the goods, so you will need to start up the transit procedure here in Belgium. Upon arrival of uh, the goods in uh, Great Britain, you will need to, in fact, present them at an office of transit and you will need to do the same thing uh, when the goods arrive in Northern Ireland. Um, I don't know, Leo, whether you will come back in the um, customs part regarding the actual use of the transit procedure, but from a VAT point of view, when you are going to use that transit procedure, which has now been clearly confirmed by HMRC, because in the beginning it was still a little bit blurry, will it be accepted? Because as from the beginning, UK made it clear, well, we are going to still uh, apply the transit protocol. However, there were never any details published around it. Um, it even went that far that at a certain time, the Belgian customs authorities published in one of their guidelines um, a remark whereby they say, well, look, because nothing is clear yet, we even advise Belgian companies to ship to the extent possible directly to the customers in Northern Ireland and not to go over the so-called landline over uh, Great Britain. But to conclude on this one, from a VAT point of view, so to the extent that you actually are going to use the entire transit procedure, um, this is and remains a direct intra-community supply. So you will need to report in your Belgian VAT return a direct intra-community supply. You will need to list it in your EC sales listing as a direct intra-community supply, whereby you will need to make reference to that XI VAT number of your customer. Okay. 
Yeah, I <laughs> Yeah, no, no. I was like, okay, uh, will, will you say something? No, be, before maybe there, there was there, there were two additional questions on Northern Ireland on the VAT number to be put on the invoice. I see that, but uh, to to pick on what you just said, uh, Claire, uh, I will address uh, a bit. There, there was no no not many questions. Honestly, I was a bit surprised regarding uh, shipment from EU. UK and, and Northern Ireland, there were not that that many questions, so I'll address them anyway. But to to your point, I think that it's we, we see a lot of of clients now uh, asking as well, is that not better just to to do EU Northern Ireland directly because then I, I stay uh, in the single market, then I don't have to do a, an export dock and so on and so forth. And yeah, it's true that it's easier now. I see people that are looking from a supply chain perspective how they can manage that because actually it's a, it's a bit more complex than than just uh, going all, all through. Uh, through the, the the GB mainland, so so there uh, I would I would invite you uh, you all from your your companies to have a look uh, to have a discussion if you're not from the supply chain from the logistic perspective from the department just have a look a discussion with your uh, with your your colleagues in order to 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 come up with the with the best. Uh, the best solution. I think that there is. It's important to uh, to to address that uh, because that's that's that, that's that's going to cause problems. Honestly, uh, I will address the transfer the transit T one T two in the um, in the in the part of customs. Okay, great. Uh, in the meanwhile, there were some supplementary questions regarding use of the VAT number. So the first one was, which VAT number to be put on the invoice from Europe to Northern Ireland, GB or XI VAT number or both? So uh, as I stated, in order to be able to invoke the exemption of an intra-community supply in Europe, you will actually need to use the XI VAT number. So you will need to quote that XI VAT number of your customer on your invoice as well as in your EC sales listing. Um, Mark will also come back to the setting up of the ERP system um, in this respect because this will of course require some uh, detailed review. Um, the next question in respect, if you sell goods locally in Northern Ireland, do you also make use of the XIVAT number? Um, there are still a lot of, we, we see a lot of uh, different opinions in that respect. Now, I always refer back to the website of HMRC. So, if you would lodge on, because in the meanwhile, in Ingrid also uh, provided the, um, the link uh, to the HMRC website where you can actually activate that where, whereby you need to inform the uh, UK VAT authorities that you're going to use that XI VAT number. If you log on to that uh, web page, then you will actually see that uh, the UK authorities are still only saying that you need to use that XI VAT number to the extent that you're actually dealing with the EU uh, with EU customers or uh, EU suppliers. So, so to the extent that, for example, you produce goods locally in Northern Ireland and that you sell them locally in Northern Ireland um, based on um, what is put has been put on the website of HMRC, you should use your GB number and not your XI VAT number. Um, so, which VAT number to put from Europe to Northern Ireland? We already had that one. There, but there may be one question if I can uh, hook up on your car there uh, on what to mention on the invoices. The, the, also, the question comes in uh, very often. I'm, I don't know whether people have asked that uh, in the in the in the chat box. I don't think so. But on the ERI number, it's also saying, oh, do I need? Is that an obligation to put my ERI number on every document that I'm, I'm pr pr producing? No, it is not. No, yeah. it's not an obligation to put your EORI number on everything you're producing, you're public, you 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 you're printing in order to go along with your with your goods. No, it is not. But it is well uh, something that you will need to have if you are importer of record in the UK. Otherwise, you may encounter a problem. Likewise, if you want to export out of the UK, you need a valid EORI number. It doesn't cut it to have the uh, uh, to have a, a, a old. Let's say Europe mainland URI number. As from first of Jan, you will encounter problems. So no, don't you don't have to print it on every document that you have, but you have to have a valid one in order to be able to do your transaction. That's for sure. So well. 
So it's yeah. I thought it was good. It made, made sense because you were talking about VAT numbers. And yeah, 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 no, no, no. And I think that there's sometimes the confusion stems from that, okay, you have on the one side the XI VAT number, which to what we read on, currently read, because please be in mind that everything is HMRC, it's publishing constantly new updates on their website but but uh, if if you will have a look at the link we we provided you with you will see clearly see that they only make reference to the use of the XIVAT number to be put on your invoice when communicating with EU suppliers or uh, EU customers so not for the internal market um so there um yeah this is something different than what is Lee, what Leo just referred to as being the XI EURI number. So your XI VAT number, that is your VAT number. You're using it to report transactions under. You're using it to, to be put on your invoice. But that has nothing to do with your XI EURI number. And Leo will provide further details when you should use that. But that is purely regarding the arrival or the shipment of goods in or out uh, in or outside Northern Ireland. So it is not because you use your XI IOTA number that you automatically will have to use your XI VAT number. And then a final question in that respect. So if you sell goods and services from Great Britain to Northern Ireland, which VAT number Northern Ireland which VAT number of Northern Ireland's customer to use? Yeah, that will be, uh, of course, a difficult, well, a difficult one. It will be a tricky one to, to get that one right in your uh, ERP system because um, at the beginning um, of um, this part of the session, we clearly said, well, Rook, the trading with Northern Ireland will still follow the EU VAT rules when selling goods from uh, the EU, but only when you're selling goods. So if you're selling goods from Europe to uh, Northern Ireland, uh, then you will need to use the uh, VAT number with the XI number, but that does not apply to the supply of services because the, for the supply of services, the normal VAT rules apply and there you should use the uh, GB number. But here the question is the goods are not going from uh, Europe, the goods are in fact shipped from Great Britain to Northern Ireland and in that respect the uh, GB VAT number is to be used because the, um, there is no communication with an EU supplier or an EU customer. So um, as you will see on the HMRC website, they only say that that XIVAT number is to be used when communicating with EU suppliers. So not uh, in respect of the supply of goods between Great Britain to Northern Ireland or from Northern Ireland to Great Britain. Uh, because they still qualify that as uh, supplies which will be subject to uh, UK VAT. Okay, so that was in fact the trading to and from uh, Northern Ireland. Um, then the next one was the use of simplification. So can I apply the triangulation simplification measures using an EU VAT registration number, even though I don't have any fixed establishment in the EU, so only a VAT registration number? Yes, you can. Uh, so, as a UK company, if you have an EU VAT registration number, you can still invoke the simplified triangulation on the basis of that EU VAT registration number. Of course, as from the 1st of January, uh, you cannot use your GB VAT number in order to use uh, the simplification. It goes without saying that if you need to review if all the other conditions are met. So the transport has to be performed, um, has, has to be linked to the first supply in the chain. This is really important. And please also be in mind that some EU VAT member states do not allow uh, the use of the simplification scheme to the extent that you would already be registered for VAT purposes in the member state of departure or arrival of the goods. Uh, but yes, you can use as a UK 
established company which has only an EU VAT registration number as a non-established entity, you can actually use the simplified triangulation. Maybe also important to notice in this respect is that it was also confirmed that the XI VAT number, so the specific Northern Ireland VAT number, uh, can also be used uh, in respect of the simplified triangulation. Then, interest uh, with regard to interest debt, do dispatches and acquisitions to and from Great Britain still need to be reported? Um, from the EU side, no. Uh, so when you ship goods from the EU to GB or from GB to EU, from an EU side, nothing has to be reported. But as mentioned during the first part of the session relating to the import of VAT, there, of course, you still need to file an arrival uh, interest at return. Then uh, the next question relate to e-commerce. So also there, of course, uh, there are changes. So uh, the UK um, will, in principle, no longer benefit, well, it will no longer benefit from the open borders that enable the freedom of movement of goods. And, and that, of course, means that there will be stricter customs regulations for packages entering um, or leaving the UK and the EU. So in that respect, you should also, and maybe Leo will also slightly touch upon this subject <clears throat> later on, is that it is even possible that some of the UK products would become uh, restricted or prohibited uh, within the European Union. So if you're a UK seller and, and you, you have uh, e-commerce with the European Union, pay attention and please review what uh, okay. whether you require any specific licenses uh, in, in that respect. Yes. Now, you're right. I'll touch upon. I'll touch upon that. For instance, when we discussed shortly before the start of the the the, the call, uh, barely the excise goods. I mean, uh, yeah. having excise that type of goods and shipped like that. Very often, if you are a platform, that's not something that you you usually do. Uh, but pay attention now. Now we're really talking about import and export. So it's no longer in track community. It's not free movement. So there, pay attention to that. But I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll come back to it for sure. Okay, perfect. Now, um, as regards VAT and customs, so as a UK entity, you will need to agree with your customer who will once again act as importer of record. To, so, who will perform the importation into the UK into the EU? So, to the extent that you, as a UK company, decides to import the goods and and. Just for the ease of reference, let's take Belgium as an example. So you're a UK supplier, you have a Belgian, Belgian uh, client who orders online goods and you ship the goods directly from the United Kingdom to Belgium. Now, to the extent that indeed you as a UK company would decide to import the goods into Belgium, that will in principle trigger a Belgian VAT registration. Um, and upon importation of the goods into Belgium, you will need to pay import VAT and import duties, unless, of course, you can benefit from an exemption uh, from that VAT or those import duties. Because currently for partials below a value of 22 euro, there is an exemption of import VAT and uh, there is an exemption of import duties for partials with a value below 150 uh, euros. Now, on the subsequent, so you perform the importation, Either you invoke the exemptions if the value of your partial is below for VAT 22 for the import duties below 150. What will happen then is then you will perform a local Belgian supply on which you will need to charge Belgian VAT. And hence you will, you will be required to register for VAT purposes uh, in Belgium. Now, now do note that those are, are the current rules. So as from the 1st of July 2021, the new e-commerce rules will enter into force in the European Union, whereby a so-called um, very specific import scheme will be created to cover distance sales, uh, whereby the goods are brought into the European Union from a country outside the European country, which will be the UK after the 1st of uh, January. So 
as from the 1st of July 2021, a very specific import scheme will be created, which will cover the distant sales of goods imported from third countries to customers in the EU, but that new import scheme will only be applicable to uh, goods with a value up to 150 euro. So unlike today, uh, when the import scheme is used, the seller will charge and collect the VAT at the point of sale to new customers and declare and pay the VAT globally, the, uh, the VAT number of identifications. So in other words, whereby currently we have an importation and then you have your local supply, your importation, you will need to verify whether the, the value of the goods is below 22 euros to benefit from that VAT exemption. That will be abolished because as from the 1st of July, there will an automatic exemption of import duties and of VAT to the extent that the value is lower of 150 euros. And you, however, you will still need to charge VAT towards your customer. Um, that VAT will need to be paid over to uh, a, a, an EU member state where you will register for VAT purposes. Because as from the 1st of July 2021, you can opt, for example, to register for VAT purposes in Belgium, and then you can pay over all the local VAT, which is due within the European Union through your Belgian VAT return. So let's say you charge, you have sales to French customers, you have sale to, to German customers, well, you can pay over that French and German VAT through your Belgian VAT return. Once again, that is the new system that will only kick in as from the 1st of July uh, 2021. But bear in mind that there are currently there is some pushback of some EU member states because at the beginning it was even foreseen that that news those new rules would become applicable as from the first of January. Now they um, that has been pushed back to the first of July, and now for example Germany and the Netherlands are lobbying to even uh, further. Um, yeah, to, to even only have those new rules uh, commencing at a later date. So that was e-commerce. Um, then about services. Um, so uh, how do we need to deal with cross your services recharges? So, uh, in fact, it is, it is quite simple um, for services. In a B2B situation where you now you are a Belgian company and you're charging uh, services to a UK company, then the place of supply in a B2B uh, in a B2B situation will be the, pl the place where the customer is located. That does not change after the end of the transition period. So now you're issuing an invoice without VAT. Why? Because the place of the supply of that service will be outside uh, Belgium, namely in the UK that will not change after the transition period. So also after the transition period, the place of supply will remain the United Kingdom. So you should still uh, issue an invoice without VAT in that respect. You need, however, to watch out for the potential application of the use and enjoyment rules, uh, not in, in Belgium because we have a very limited uh, application of the use and enjoyment rule, but there are some other countries like example Spain and that use and enjoyment rule entails that when your service is located based on the normal B2B supply rules outside the European Union that to the extent it can be demonstrated that, that the actual use and the enjoyment of that service lays within the European Union that uh, based on those use and enjoyment rules, local VAT will be due because based on that use and enjoyment rule um, the place of supply will no longer be outside the European Union, but will be in the member state where you have a use and enjoyment. For example, Spain is a country which has a, a very large uh, application of that use and enjoyment rule, um, whereby even, for example, marketing services uh, can potentially fall under the application of that use and enjoyment rule. So there you may have a difference because currently that use and enjoyment rule will not kick in 
because the UK is still part of the European Union. So to the extent that based on the normal B2B rule, place of supply is UK, the use and enjoyment rule cannot be invoked because the UK is still part of the European Union. After the transition period, that use and enjoyment rule can potentially be invoked by some of the EU member states. Um, then the last part that relates to uh, the refund. So uh, refund of VAT, of course, there you need to pay attention. If you're a UK company, you're currently applying for a refund of VAT under an A directive refund claim that will no longer be possible as uh, after the 1st of January, because then you will need to invoke the 13th um, directive in that respect. Now, um, uh, I see, is it likely that the OSS shop for e-commerce will actually be applied as for 1st of July? Let's hope so, yes, but again, as stated, uh, yeah, EU member states like the Netherlands and Germany are really pushing to, to, to not um, have it come into force on the 1st of uh, July, but only on the 1st of January 2021, uh, 22, sorry. And then uh, one last one, uh, which I would like to discuss, are the so-called year-end rebates. So the, the, there is an agreement between the EU and the UK that, in fact, whenever you supply goods um, before the end of the transition period, but they would only arrive after the transition period, that, in fact, to the extent that you have such a situation, that in principle, that transaction is still to be treated as an intra-community supply. So let's say you ship goods on the 30th of December, but they only arrive uh, on the 5th of January. Well, from a VAT point of view, that transaction is still to be qualified as an intra-community supply because the transportation started before the end of the transition period. Um, Lee will certainly touch upon this, this topic as well uh, during his session, certainly when it comes to excise goods, because there, there are some very peculiar attention points to take into consideration. Uh, but just to come back to the year-end rebate itself, then, because in a lot of agreements we see year-end rebates. So what will happen, uh, you are now still supplying to your UK customers, all those transactions are treated as intra-community supplies. What will happen then in, in February when you are going to actually calculate the year-end rebate? At that time, you calculate your year-end rebate and you will issue a credit note. Now, in principle, because that credit note credits a previous transaction, the credit note will follow the VAT treatment of the previous transaction. That previous transaction is an intra-community supply. So as a general rule, um, you should apply uh, or treat that credit note as being a credit note relating to intra-community supplies. Now that can lead to um, potentially issues with your uh, EC sales listing because on your EC sales listing, in March next year, you can no longer report any transactions with a GBVOT number. So there you might have a in, in, in respect of reporting that. Um, and I think that brings us to the end of my part, well, to the VAT part of this session. And then after talking for 40 minutes, I'm very glad to hand over the word to, to Lionel. <laughs> and you're not over yet, Claire. We, uh, still, no, okay. get, we still get questions coming in. Uh, I'll, okay. take, I'll take my notes because uh, there, there are things that I want to, to tell uh, uh, people. And, uh, you know, with the age or the Brexit, it's, it's, uh, it gets you to forget things. So uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start with those. Um, Year-end rebates, refunds, what just uh, uh, Clara said. Um, Year-end rebates, I was in a session yesterday uh, regarding customs valuation, 
and apparently in Germany. There are some uh, ongoing court cases that we will see popping up uh, in the coming days and weeks. So for those who are interested, uh, just, uh, yeah, <laughs> you have nothing to do be best during your Christmas holiday. So just watch Curia that will come, come over uh, regarding year and rebates further to the Amamatsu case. Uh, because that's still uh, still living there, and the Hamamatsu case can do we have to do here and rebates? Yes, no. If we have a transfer pricing, what do we do? And blah blah blah. blah. So actually, there the, the 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 position of the different member states are is still a bit different. The EU Commission found that it's very clear. Uh, the EU member states thinks totally differently. So uh, so there is still uh, a bit of unrest on that one. So on year and rebates, watch this. That will still come. Why I'm doing that link? Because of course, with the Brexit, that will be just an accelerator of that that kind of stuff because it's very close to us. So pay attention. Uh, that that will come. Uh, put that on your radar. That's one. On the refund, very important as well. We are not used to that, but don't forget that every time you will pass the border, and there there was questions on on the the import duty rate. So I'll come to that later. But whenever you pay duties. When you pay duties, you cannot recover those duties. Certainly not in Europe, uh, unless you have a very good reason for that and not just, oh, I didn't knew that I had to send that back to, to the UK, so can I get my money back? It doesn't work like that in the, in the EU. And in the UK, certainly in the beginning, they don't intend to change the customs legislation to, to resemble like the US, because in the US you can do that. Uh, you can get duty refund, duty drawback if you export, ex export your goods. Uh, not in Europe and in the beginning, not in the UK. So pay attention. Every time you cross a border, you pay duties. So if you want to go to refund, think about it. It's not that easy in, in old Europe, let's say, and in, in, in young uh, customs legislation UK. So so pay attention to that. Uh, I don't want you to spend too much money uh, uh, without knowing this. So that's that requires a bit of preparation and strategy as well. All right. So that brings me to uh, the, the customs and international trade part. Bah, it was. It's quite a, uh, 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 also in French we say pavé. So it's, there are quite some things to be discussed. But <laughs> yeah, Claire, I didn't find the word directly, so that's why. But uh, uh, but before I, I jump to the questions, uh, allow me uh, one um, ERI in Europe. ERI number in Europe. We saw that from the German customs. Uh, we received that last week. That between the and that's going to be uh, applicable for all Europe, of course. It's not only German, Germany. Uh, between 28 December and 1st of, of of January, if you don't have a URI number that it's up and running, valid, and that you haven't prepared, and you request a new URI number, and that URI number is being given by one authority close to that date, there is a huge chance, not to say a certainty. That your ERI number will not be, well, it will be granted, but will not be active before beginning of Jan. So you may miss a few export and import because you just cannot give an active ERI number. So one call for you, you don't have to save the world with Brexit. There might be some activities that you still want to take. If you don't have a, a valid active ERI number, please do that. Uh, in the coming days, so that by the end of the year, you don't have a problem. If you have a number, for instance, the companies that are a UK entity that have a BEGP number or, or or that kind of stuff, if you have that, no problem, it will be activated on the 1st of January. All right? So I just wanted to, to, to make that, uh, to make that comment. That's the first comment I wanted to make. Second, don't forget, Netherlands goes with the exporter of record definition live on the 1st of Jan as well. So for all the companies that are has a platform, Netherlands, it's a very good pl logistic platform like Belgium, like other countries are. In the Netherlands, we see a lot of attraction and attraction. If you export to the UK out of the Netherlands on 1st of Jan, and you have your UK entity on 1st of Jan as exporter, on 1st of Jan, it's a non-EU entity. If it's a non-EU entity and you export out of the uh, Netherlands, pay attention this will block. You need to be represented. And when I say represented, you need to have someone that agrees to take your place as exporter of records. That's a new definition. It's going up live on the 1121 uh, uh, in Netherlands. I'm saying that because it's already live since July 18 in Belgium, the United States of Europe. Yeah? Uh, so it will be live in Netherlands. So pay attention. If you have your, your 
exporting entity is a UK entity uh, and you export out of the Netherlands, pay attention, you might have something to do. And for all the others, sorry to have spoiled your moment. It's uh, it's two minutes, but I, I found that it's quite important. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, uh, so EMCS in the UK, uh, also EMCS in the UK, we were discussing that with uh, with Claire, I think that it was yesterday, right? That actually they they, they sent that over, uh, gov.uk. Uh, and the funny part is that before with Claire and all the team, we received like, like 100 message a day. Now they are being clever. They sent one message a day. <laughs> it's it's the daily update of the Gov UK. And then when you click on that, boom, you see all the changes. So pay attention. Go to the very final line because there, that's where you can find your treasure. Uh, EMCS in the UK uh, will will stop. <laughs> will simply stop as from first of Jan. And it's logic. EMCS excise movement excise movement control system. It's the electronic tracking and dealing management of excise suspension movements in the EU. The UK goes out, it's normal that they get out of that community. And that community is an IT community, well, IT, yeah, it's an IT system. So if they are out, well, I mean that they are out. So there, again, warm call to all the, uh, all, all the companies that are working in the excise, and apologies for the others. If you started a movement before and uh, before the end of, of December on excise, because for the others, for the others, I, I, I'll explain how does that work. But for the excise, pay attention. Since they will be out of the EMCS, in order to clear that and to mention that in the EMCS, you will have to, to tweak it a bit. I mean, discuss with the, the customs authorities. I know that uh, Michel from the Belgian customs authorities was uh, was there in the beginning. Now I think that he had to leave. I sent him the message saying, "Okay, do you want to intervene?" Because we wanted to have also Werner and the and the team uh, work uh, uh, intervening here from uh, from Belgian customs. We're working with them a lot. So uh, so there, uh, but they they had another meeting. But Michel could make it for for a few minutes. If you're still there, Michel, don't hesitate to to jump in or to send me a message if you want right. us to unmute yourself. Uh, but actually, from a, from a, a Belgian perspective, you initiate that movement, uh, and it's in the UK. And then actually now, it means that your guarantee is blocked on that movement. So if you want to 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 recover your guarantee, to relieve it, uh, you need to clear the, the document in the correct way. You know, the correct way means that it has to be cleared. But since the UK is out, you need to 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 tweak it a bit. That's what I, I mean. You need to bring the, the proof of of clearance in the UK to, to the authorities, whether it's Belgium, Netherlands, or whatever, uh, French, in order to, to, to clear that. So that's 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 quite important. Now, well, we wanted to, we did not have a, a, that many questions on, on exercise, but I wanted to uh, uh, to make that one. So I think that I'm, 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 uh, I got my my different points. Uh, maybe to start with, uh, I think, Ingrid, that there was a question on FTA. <laughs> I think that it was uh, where I said, okay, maybe Claire and I will take it. Where, where was it? Mm -hmm. Sorry for that. Um, it was a question. No, while, while you're looking, uh, Leo, maybe uh, there is another small question purely regarding VAT. So that gives you the time to look up your question. Uh, so uh, there was a, a small question which came in whether uh, you need to appoint uh, an, a fiscal representative in, in the United Kingdom. So I'm just taking back the question. Um, so the actual question was, can a, a Belgian company can go for a, a direct GB registration or should they appoint a fiscal representative? Um, well, currently, and, and once again, un, unless something would change, um, in the UK, there is to date no obligation to appoint a fiscal representative for EU companies. So uh, you should be fine without one. Mm. Um, it, it is not like that the other way around. So there are other, uh, the, some of the EU member states will oblige uh, a UK company to appoint a fiscal representative. Belgium is one of those countries whereby every non-EU country, non-EU established company will need to appoint a fiscal representative. Um, so uh, that is something you need to take into consideration when you are a UK company. Voila, Leo. Maybe you found your question back then. <laughs> I, I found it. It was in the chat. Uh, so can you assume just because something is shipped from the EU to the UK that it qualifies for zero percent duty under the FTA? So if there is a well, first 
uh, just because it's shipped is not sufficient, unfortunately, to qualify for FDA. All right, and that's a. I think it's a very good question because that's something that that is 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 even if people know that actually it will pass, uh, it's still in the system or it's still in the process that it's not really you know uh, strictly uh, applied. Uh, the management of origin within companies remains remains a trouble, uh, so it's difficult, uh, and I understand that. Uh, but just because it's shipped from the EU to the UK, you do not qualify for 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 zero percent duty. Why? Because you need to prove that the goods are from preferential origin in order to do that. How to do that? You have basically, let's say, give or take three three big rules, three more important rules. I will not uh, dwell on that too much. Uh, but actually, it's a tariff shift. It's a it's a value principle, and it's a production process. To to, to put it very broadly, um, you need to be able to demonstrate that, and then you are eligible for a preferred duty rate. Whether it's going to be 0%, this remains to be seen. Why is that? Because actually nothing now in our hands can tell that actually everything will be put to 0%. It is possible, but what we see, for instance, as a um, as type of free trade agreement, though I personally don't think that we will follow, Europe will follow that, that trend, but uh, what is true is, is that uh, if you take a look at Japan and Europe, JEFTA agreement, you have it's degressive. Is with the years, you go down in terms of tariff. I'm not sure. Uh, it might be so that in the negotiation, certain sectors, certain chapters, certain section within the 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 the, the, the tariff or the, the combined nomenclature will be due with with duties. So it's not a given that it's all going to be zero percent. That's what I want to say. And but in order to apply to 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 be granted the possibility to, to to benefit from a lower duty rate, you need to be able to demonstrate that that uh, that origin. All right. So that's for the for the question. If I jump into the the Excel, uh, because we listed all the questions that we received in the Excel, will community codes in the UK be different than the U U ones, the EU ones? Well, actually, to start with, well, it it will at some point in time. Uh, that's for sure. Europe will work with direct ten digits. Um, the 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 UK as is following up. Uh, is following his own way now, so they don't have and they will not have the same uh, commodity codes as we have, uh, but the basis will be the same. They also abide by the uh, by uh, World Customs Organization, uh, World uh, Trade Organization uh, principles. So they at six digit level, it's going to be the same thing. Uh, they're going to go to a eight digit level with the same thing as well. So I think that that's that's important. But of course, they have the possibility to alter not only the commodity codes so it means would they be different yeah that's going to be different at some point in time second they can create actually also they can decide to create sub uh sub chapters sub headings uh there uh, that we don't uh, that we don't have like on 10 digit with the with the with the eu that's very possible and very often i mean that's that's a technique that it's uh, being used in order to protect your market uh, so that's uh, that's something that you you should watch out for, uh, and these these are definitely uh, things that are out there. And of course, they they have the opportunity, and that was uh, that was one of the questions. They have the opportunity to technically raise import duties on the product that they they feel they should uh, they should protect. Uh, either they should protect, or they 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 think that actually they need to go. Uh, they they need to to um, uh, well to uh, to tax more. So, for instance, uh, uh, it was it was not it was a general question, huh? but can you give us a few examples of the duty rates and so on and so forth? So, what will be the most taxed and so? On? Quite quite broad, huh? It's <laughs> it's 99, 99 chapters, more than one hundred fifty thousand positions uh, EU and one uh, one hundred fifty thousand position in the UK. So that that's quite a lot. But if we take uh, textile, twelve uh, percent. Uh, so that's that's similar to to what we have here with uh, duties at at level that can that can be reduced, of course. Uh, but I mean, some chapters, chapter sixty four, both clothing, go up to seventeen uh, percent, for instance. In terms of automo uh, automotive and uh, and vehicles, then uh, in principle ten percent, so it stays like in the in the EU. But actually, you can have for uh, motor vehicles transporting goods, it can go from zero to twenty two uh, percent. Uh, so pay so pay attention. Tractors 16% for 
food. Uh, I'm not gonna, I will do food and drinks uh, also very uh, very rapidly. If you have an interest, a genuine interest in 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 certain uh, certain products, just reach out to us and, uh, and then we can discuss uh, seeing what what is the impact on your on your product. But I've, I've shared also the UK tariff uh, earlier on, so you should be in good shape there. Uh, uh, food and drink, uh, going from chapter 16 to 2 to 22, for instance, meat 16.6 percent. .6%, sorry, I'm reading a lot of information. Uh, with the highest of 303 um, euro, that's going to be transferred in pounds uh, per 100 kilo. Uh, sugars, uh, sugar is also uh, always very taxed, uh, 41.9 euro uh, per 100 kilo, uh, but uh, with some uh, highest at 50.7 for isobutyl. Uh, chapter 18, cocoa, between 0 and 9.6. Uh, that's something that we know. 19, cereals, floors, starch, milk and stuff, uh, between 3.8 and 10.1. Uh, but also pay attention with a, a net uh, a euro or pound per kilo as well. Uh, so that's that's going to be in, important. Uh, preparation of vegetables, 15, uh, 14, uh, between 14 and 18. I'm always done. <laughs> stay, stay tuned. And then drinks, uh, beverages, uh, spirits, vinegar, between 0 and 9.6 duty per hectoliter. Uh, but there you need to pay attention to the type of product that it is. Um, but actually, it can go to 22.4% uh, with 20, with 20.6 euro per 100 uh, Kilo or liter. So, so there, uh, it's a bit of something. So there, it is. It is out there. It is out there. And if I can just make a comment, um, a few months ago, uh, it was Theresa May, then Boris Johnson, that went to um, to uh, uh, to publish a, a list of Excel uh, where eighty three or eighty seven percent of the product were zero rated. Actually, not. It's not like that anymore. The, I mean, with Claire, we 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 warn the people to say, mm, I'm not quite sure that it will stay like this. I mean, honestly, guys, they need to find money somewhere. <laughs> so, so I mean, and taxes, duties, it's it's one one way to do to do it. So that's uh, uh that's interesting. All right. So that was uh, for for these these questions related to the commodity code. Apply for deferment account. Uh, for the UK customs duties, options for foreign companies, options for foreign companies. I mean, you are you are a EU-based company. You you start to do business in the UK. It means you import in the UK. Then technically, two big two big uh, ways of doing that. You see that it's a uh, it's a uh, it's something that it's it's really traction. You need to have a permanent establishment there. You are there. Blah 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 blah. blah. You take in, into account all the possible uh, 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 impact. You can have your own company in the UK. Then you can apply for your own deferment account. You can do your own thing yourself. You can declare yourself. You can have your bank guarantee in place. You can have your, your deferment account in place on your own name. Why? Because you have a UK entity. If you are not established and you want just to do business, import, because you have clients there and you have an ERI UK and a VAT, uh, a UK VAT number, uh, actually then how, how do you do with the deferment account? Very often, what is the the the, the mainstream uh, solution there for from people is like working with uh, uh, with local uh, brokers and logistic partners that actually have the deferment account, and then you can use uh, you can use them uh, theirs. In order to use theirs, of course, there will be some some elements that will be charged uh, to to you, but actually that's. Uh, that's a small thing for uh, for what it can give you. So, so I think that I definitely encourage you to work with uh, uh, with the third party brokers and and and, part, and logistic partners. You will need them uh, when Brexit is there. So I think that these are uh, these are a bit the, uh, um, the the elements that are I think were were of uh, of importance uh, for that questions. Uh, uh, looking at my my uh, Excel. Uh, um, Relevance of income terms. I mean, you are uh, Claire, of course, has touched upon that. Uh, just one one note: income terms very important. DDP, pay attention to that. It means that actually you need to do the the whole shabam. But even if you don't, if you have an income terms where normally you are not supposed to do anything there, uh, you are not supposed to be the exporter out of the UK. You are not supposed to be the importer. Pay attention to the contract terms. Uh, we we often uh, refer to it with Claire and the team as the silent killer. Uh, because you can you can decide everything you can have a structure supply chain structure blah 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 everything is done we have questions on IT we will go to that uh, as well but boom you look at your contract ah 
I'm supposed to do this, this, this. I did not anticipate that because I thought that due to my income term, I mean, that was the, 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 yeah, the ownership was passed. And so I didn't have to do that. But actually, if it's specified in the contract, you will have to either adapt that. So give a call to your supplier or to your client very fast, or you will need to, to well, to follow up what the contract is saying, because otherwise it's a contract breach. And so you can end up even with an income term that says, I don't know, FOB, CIF or whatever, you can you can be the party that has agreed at some point in time in your contract that you will be, you would bring the goods to the uh, to the customer. So that's that's really important. And from time to time, we see a disconnect between the income terms and the way the contract has been has been labeled. So please, if, I know that it's, it's a it's difficult because the contracts are not all digital, so you need to look at your grand grimoire and then have a look at that. But it's it's worth it's worth uh, it's worth the the ride, all right? So that's uh, that's on the income term what I wanted to uh, to say. Uh, I think that uh, yeah, uh, EOI number does uh, every everybody needs an import reference number to cross the channel uh, from EU uh, to UK. I would also. Uh, like to link that to a question that I received earlier on Calais. Uh, pop, pop, pop. Uh, one of the first questions I received uh, from a shipment from Calais uh, by ferry. I'm looking, it will not be long, sorry for that. But pop, pop. Uh, and actually, uh, in Calais, what you need to know uh, is that uh, you need to. Uh, Voilà. Uh, do we need the import document number if we pre lodge declaration before we will be able to enter the ferry in Calais? So pay attention. Uh, in Calais, France, Wow, uh, they have applied the smart border. Smart border mean that actually they want to. They they are very. It's obvious that actually there will be a lot of of uh, um, a lot of congestion there. So what they want to do is that to apply for uh, for a very efficient model. In order to do that, what they've done um, is that uh, they say that in, for the smart border, what you need to have, you technically will have a barcode. A barcode that will be your import number, and you need to have that barcode with uh, the the carrier, the gaylord that actually will go through uh, will go through uh, Calais uh, in order to uh, to leave the EU and then to enter the UK. So on the smart border, you need that barcode, and that barcode is the link technically between the shipment, the import declaration. For instance, also the number plate of the truck and so on and so forth. It will be there for import declaration, for export declaration, for transit declaration. So that's something that you need to have uh, with you. So that relates also to the other question. Do we need the import a reference number uh, to cross the channel? Uh, actually, I would say yes, uh, you need to have that. But uh, if you use the smart border of, uh, of Calais, of France, uh, then normally you should have that, that barcode I mentioned um, with you. So that's a... Uh, that I think that's a, a practical answer to, to, to that question. Uh, also, uh, some goods, uh, Claire referred to it uh, when she was talking about e-commerce. Uh, UK goes out, brush, restriction comes in. What are those restrictions? You can have export control. Pay attention. Export control, dual use items. Before, whew, easy. You have a French company, you have a, a, a Belgian company, whatever type of companies, and then you have a premise out of the UK. You are shipping goods from the EU mainland and from the UK. It's one legislation, you're right. As from the 1st of uh, of, uh, of Jan, that these are two different legislation. UK export control legislation, EU export control legislation, not the same. It means that your license, your global license to export goods and to do whatever you like, will only be applicable for EU. It will not be applicable for the goods in the UK. You will have to apply to get that. And if you don't have that, it's it's funny or not, but you don't even get to the export document because you blocked before. You need to show that you have a license in order to get to the point where you can export your goods. Before, well, I don't even I don't even bother about the ARI number. It's a non-issue. You just cannot export it. And if you do, it's fraud and all these these funny things. And that's that's criminal law. So just take my advice. Don't go there. So it's a, it's just pay attention. There are some products. I mean, think about all the dual use, and it can be far uh, far reaching. If you have some clients that are in the military, even linked to military. Uh, even if you are not in the military uh, articles yourself and, 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 and product yourself, items yourself, if you sell, um, let's catch on clothes, 
Article 4, if you sell to military, then you will be the same thing. So that's that's a bit the, uh, uh, the thing. Main message here, takeaway, pay attention. Export control kicks in as from 1st of Jan as well. So it means that if you have a global license, pay attention to the impact on the, on, on, on the UK. That's that's a real one. That's a, It's going to annoy you. Uh, it means no movement of goods whatsoever, right? So that's a, it's a standstill. So that's really important. In terms of, uh, of, of goods, uh, that are uh, restricted, of course. I mean, I mentioned the excise on the platform, uh, the e-commerce platform, of course. Um, Customs doesn't like that because, I mean, that's that's go un unnoticed. Uh, and and then you you have a, a company feeding goods and that type of stuff. So that's 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 a bit dangerous. And then you have the sensitive. If you are in the sensitive um, product area, uh, then you have a, you have problem. Uh, you, well, no, you have problems. You need to anticipate what's going to happen. Uh, and what's going to happen? Maybe that. Oh, how to lift a, 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 a problem if if your if your goods are facing one because of the Brexit. So keep in mind again that brings us back to preparation, uh, community codes in uh, community codes and legislation. Uh, just uh, looking at that and how to practically uh, bridge that gap. So I think that this is really, really important. Uh, trend shipment. Um, so that's a, that's a bit what 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 are we going to do about about that and so on and so forth. So there are unfortunately there are, there are several uh, different uh, different uh, scenarios. Uh, I, I don't have time to 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 go through them all, uh, but one thing is for sure: you can use transit document. You can use transit document to go to the the UK. I think that it is really good. You can use transit document. You can use T1 and you can use T2. I mean, you can use T2 for what? For exactly what uh, what uh, Claire has been saying regarding the situation with Northern Ireland. I go in the UK. I go in the UK and then I go to Northern Ireland. Yes, indeed. It depends on on what type of 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 um, of, um, of delivery you are doing, but actually. One of the the document that you need to put up in order to do that is the T2 document in order for you to uh, to transfer. Again, uh, I reinforce that EU Northern Ireland you don't need it. You need it if you go through the UK and out of the UK going to Northern Ireland. There you have a there you have a uh, a customs impact in terms of compliance where you need to come up with the documents. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's that's really important there. Uh, so you need uh, you need you need to have that. If you go uh, if you ship goods, uh, I'm reading also the, the case that I received. If you ship goods from Netherlands to the UK and then to to Northern Ireland, transit possible? Uh, yes, uh, indeed. That's exactly the case we 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 we're talking about. Uh, some of our clients they go directly to Northern Ireland now, uh, but actually a majority of them are. Transshipping this through uh, the UK, that you will need exactly to uh, to issue the the transit document. All right, so that's that's really uh, uh, important. Uh, I'm I'm conscious of the time, and and because uh, uh, Mark, oh, I, I really want to give uh, Mark the time because you uh, you see that also in the in the chat there are quite some questions on on on, uh, uh, on IT, and I, I definitely want to uh, Mark to use it. And if we need to uh, to spend a, f a few five minutes. For the ones that are interested, uh, stay, stay tuned. And Mark, if you if you if you are not have, have another problem with that, uh, you can also go a bit beyond the timing. Uh, but uh, returning goods, um, I think that this one is also very important. Returning goods, what does that mean? You send goods to the UK and they go back, and you send them back and you go uh, uh, like this, you know, that kind of stuff. Test uh, test product samples, returning goods. Uh, certainly in e-commerce, you where you have a return uh, percentage of uh, about thirty percent. Every time you're going to cross a border, if your goods are subject to duties, you will have to pay those duties. You will have, you hear me well, you will have to pay the duties. So it's not one time, two times, three times, it can be multiple times. Unless you go and you put yourself with a very strong return procedure uh, process. That's, there are different possibilities to do that. One of the easiest ones is to use a T2L, T2L document which is a t2l that's that's not a t2 huh? that's sort of different yet it's against customs but that's not a t2 a t2 is a is a transit compliance document that helps you to move goods around t2l doesn't do that at all t2l means yes those products that are being shipped out yes they were from eu origin or they were technically also union goods it means that at some point in time the, the duties have been paid on those goods and if they go back and you have those T2L, and you can show that you haven't altered the goods, changed the goods, modified, manufactured the goods. What it gives, 
bam, then you can enter without paying duties. But there, there is a twist where you need to pay uh, to discuss with the authorities. And that's that's unfortunate that Michel had to, to leave uh, because that's what we're doing as we speak now. What about the goods that have been ex <laughs> sent to the UK before uh, before the date and they come back after the date? You can say, yeah, T2L, yeah, but they have never been exported technically from a customs perspective because it's an intractability supply and it's not an export. And if it's not an export, when they go back and they knock on the door, then customs says, yeah, <laughs> I, do, I do believe you, but I don't have a document that proves that these ones were exported in the first place. Bear in mind, what we are doing is that we are, it's a stream um, uh, of proof, and then we, we list uh, the, the different proofs, and we have discussion with the authorities to demonstrate that these goods were either union goods or EU uh, manufactured goods, originating goods. That's really important. It means money for you. Because oh, the UK might be a bit lenient with uh, how to enter in the UK. You see that with border operating model. They had to do that to say, yeah, you, you have six months to defer the, the, the declaration. Not, not in the importation in the EU. The EU doesn't move. The, the EU stays as, as it is. Whether you import from the UK or you import from the US or China or Pakistan or the South Africa, they don't care. It's a border. So keep that in mind. Uh, all right. So I hope that actually that was helpful. Uh, don't 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 hesitate. Uh, I could not monitor the chat while we I was talking. Don't hesitate to to continue to to shoot questions at the purpose of this open sessions. Uh, we love that, even though it's a bit like a, a oral exam. We like that with uh, with uh, with Claire and the team. That's what we are here for. Um, conscious of that, that there are still some some questions that might not have been uh, answered. And my apologies for that. We try to uh, uh, to give you the latest news and the most important news for for the community so thanks for that thanks for for staying uh, that many uh, also after one hour and 46 minutes so stay tuned i now have from uh, from the muscles from brussels uh, mr mark Ussels. <laughs> hey mark with that kind of intro you need to <laughs> you need to yeah remember. i need to muscle up so uh good uh, morning everybody so uh, my name is mark Ussels. i'm um have uh, captured some questions regarding ERP, enterprise resource planning, uh, like it is mentioned in abbreviation. We all know that the system can only be set up once the law is known. So uh, I think we have floor earth for the last uh, more than one hour that there is still some unclarity, I would say, or uh, some things needs to be cleared out, but some things are known in this respect. So. Um, how to make your ERP system ready for uh, for uh, yeah the Brexit, uh, whatever the political direction it goes into. I think um, I mentioned it already in the chat for the people using uh, SAP. There is an, a clear OSS, a uh, clear there is an OSS note uh, published by SAP, which is of course taking the current position politically and known by them as well about how should you change your system uh, going forward um, on oracle they are working on it they've promised me i would come forward with something uh, next week um, other systems of course also need to be updated uh, accordingly but uh, i will since there were a lot of questions about sap talk about sap uh, first uh, and in general, you could say that uh, you need to check your tax codes, I would say. So um, as already elaborated on, if you sell goods uh, to uh, the UK, to the GB, uh, it will be regarded as an export of, uh, of goods. Probably you have already in your system a tax code for exports. So you will just need to make sure that it's rooted into the, right, the correct way in your tax procedure for your condition logic, like a setup for AP and AR. That this is correctly routed to the new tax codes to be used as of 1st of January 21. And I think that's important. Now, there have already been some questions. What about invoices from 2020 uh, issued in 21? I think that's part of your internal control system that you should foresee. You still need to check in a transition period as well if the invoice relates to 2020. So it follows the correct tax procedure in your ERP system or not and there is always a possibility to manually change your uh, tax codes if it should be wrong so i think the the moment of controlling your vat return submitted in 
January and also potentially in February and maybe potentially also in March, we'll need some internal controls in place just to make sure that it has been picked up from the right uh, from the right source, I would say. So uh, being it uh, in the EU or not in the EU, I think that's important uh, to follow up. Claire already mentioned that for the UK, you can use the deferral of import uh, VAT. So there you need to make sure that your uh, tax codes for import in the UK, if you have a UK business over there, is correctly routing that to the two boxes of the VAT return, which are needed to declare the deferral of import VAT. Um, bearing in mind as well that in the UK, as you may know, there is an other regime kicking in called Make Tax Digital for Businesses, uh, which you also need to follow a digital, a digital uh, root cause of everything that is uh, that is done. This will kick in 1st of April normally. So meaning that manual changes as of that moment in time are in principle not allowed anymore. So you need to track, you have to need to keep digital records of what's what's going on over there. It has been mentioned before, but I will reiterate it. In the SAP note, I think what has been done very well over there is um, SAP has not created, and you should also not do that, create a new country for Northern Ireland. Huh? That's politically, politically not right, and it's not on the agenda. So uh, <laughs> uh, they, therefore, as a people put forward in the note, use a region. Yeah, Make sure that Northern Ireland XI is a region of GB, because like mentioned before, and I think the question has been asked about goods and services, uh, they will follow um, a little bit of, of different uh, regimes. So Northern Ireland goods only, is a separate treatment on services. So therefore you need to keep it under the header of, uh, of GB to make sure that this is uh, correctly uh, addressed, uh, I would say. Now, what is also important is that uh, XI notification that you can put uh, set up correctly in your system. Uh, it is uh, pretty important also to make sure that in your master data of your customer, you also check that they're flagged with the region XI, of course, because otherwise the system the system is not magic. I always say that the system is as smart as the people who have set it up. Yeah? Um, so therefore, it's important in the master data of your customers, you make, need to make sure that you flag that correctly, that this customer is in Northern Ireland, because otherwise it will not pick that up correctly in your tax condition logic as well. So I think that's important uh, to mention out here. Uh, we will share. I will share the OSS note the number if you want. Uh, upon request, there are a little bit of notes uh, attached to it. It links. It goes to your financial postings. It goes to GTS, which is the custom solutions that you can utilize. You have notes on on Intrastat. It's a very um, elaborate work that needs to that needs to be done. So I think it's uh, it's COVID nineteen still. I can only give one very good advice. Test, test, test. So make sure your system is correctly set up. Take some scenarios of, uh, let's say, um, a sale of a good to Northern Ireland. Is that picked up correctly? Yes, no. Please do test it. Huh? And if not, make sure that before submitting your um, documents and or returns, that of course you check uh, that these are correctly routed into your system. As mentioned before, it, uh, the system is not uh, always very smart. You need to check it whether it's uh, done uh, correctly. Now, having said that, I think it's also important that you put in the system also your XI numbers of your customers. As mentioned before, uh, I think it was by Claire, that you need to ask for um, GB Customers need to ask for um, an XI uh, number. Of course, you need to make you need to have that XI number as mentioned before. It's a material condition to exempt your EU supply from Belgium to Northern Ireland. Uh, if you want to apply without VAT, or you want to yeah, exempt the transaction correctly without VAT, you know that since uh, since um, earlier this year. Uh, that is a material condition to check your uh, VAT number. The XI numbers most probably I will be will be accessible also in the VIS website, as you know. 
If you don't know the VS website, we have also a tool for that called the Robovat tool. If you want to automatically check your VAT numbers, but I think it's important that the XI numbers will be checked into the VS website. Yeah, the GB numbers will be getting out of the VS website. There is a specific um, website which is accessible already today. Um, to check uh, the VAT numbers for GB, so we can share that also potentially in the chat as well, so that you that you have that. So I think that's important also to mandatory check your VAT numbers, like I said before, to correctly exempt the transactions, uh, yes or no. So I think that is um, that's very important. I will share the OSS notes uh, with whomever wants to have them, and again, it's work in progress. Claire already mentioned return goods uh, stuff. Our, our Leo explained it. We also discussed about year-end discounts. I think it's clear to say that uh, if you give year-end discounts from Belgium to the GB or to the UK, that this will not be longer be able to be reported in the European sales listing. So you will need to report it uh, like we have came to the conclusion with our technical committee to be waited for the Fox, I would say, from the Belgian government as well, I was uh, going forward, that these transactions will need to be reported in box 49 of your VAT return. So also there, your routing of your discounts, although it would be an EU discount uh, related to an old EU discount, that you still report that in the right box of the VAT return, because you know in Belgium, there is a requirement that you reconcile your turnover from your accounting with your VAT return, and this, this will remain in place, as we all know. Having said that, uh, shortly about uh, the data model, which is um, um, going to be in place uh, going forward, I think uh, you still can submit uh, UK customs uh, documents with some kind of delay. On the next slide, we have made a kind of a data model uh, related to which data that you will all need. So if you have not done everything before um, with respect to customs declarations on the on the next slide, you could uh, see um, some data elements that, that you need uh, from delivery note, invoice, intrastat, and other uh, data that you will need. I think it's important going forward to check the completeness of the data that you do need. Um, as well as um, the accuracy of data, because as we all do know, if you sell intercompany wise or whatever at an other um, value price, maybe uh, depending who the end customer is, I think this will also um, require some attention because as we all know, uh, customs and transfer pricing is not the best marriage ever there. So they will look at uh, at pricing uh, differently. If you change your price intercompany for whatever shipment uh, to to another um, higher uh, amount, I think this is something that you should avoid. So I think they're also like as if you send goods to Russia or to another country out of the EU, make sure that your pricing is uh, correctly looked at. So therefore. We have made this model available that as PwC, we are happy to help you with the data from delivery documents, invoices, intrastat, other ERP data, and other data sources, because you will need some information like EORI numbers, uh, like uh, container material, affairs stuff, license plates, stuff that you all have that ready in order to submit either via sub gts or via the chief website of customs in order to be able to submit that correctly to um, the customs authorities in the uk and we all know once it is declared it's difficult to go back and uh, remediate what you have declared so like always, do it once, do it good. Use that uh, transition period if you don't are not familiar enough or your teams are not familiar enough which, which data is important. We will also check with, of course, um, uh, EORI verification. We can also check with Tariq databases and so on, also which uh, Leo has elaborated on for declaring customs duties. If we then go back to the previous slide, please. Um, where we say uh, what are the other elements um, that are needed to be addressed. And that's the last point I want to uh, mention over here. 
is um, these are the data elements that you could see one slide back please that you go i think one of the important things still to be addressed is there is something like your invoices and or accounting needs to be in the eu hmm? the uk has left or will leave so actually technically if your servers are in the uk you have an issue yeah? because uh, just give the example about france germany as well if you keep your data out of the eu your invoices and accounting in france there is it is allowed if there is a material convention of cooperation possible. But yeah, for the moment, there is nothing agreed yet. So in principle, you have an issue. In Germany, the local tax office needs to approve it. So I think it's important to verify if you have service with your accounting out of the EU, that you make sure that this is also uh, being addressed. Having said that, uh, I think we're on top of the hour. Uh, I would give one UK advice is stay calm, carry on and listen to our next open house for the new update, I would say. But giving back to Leo and Claire now. That's that's good. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mark. Uh, also, that brings us uh, slightly to to uh, to an end. Um, we, we we wanted also to uh, to end up with, with, with Claire and Mark uh, and Nadia with the, the the slide it's not a slide about uh promoting pwc um I, I don't think that actually you you've heard anything uh marketing wise uh for the two hours and i think that it's really the, the purpose of this kind of session uh but i mean basically we're working on brexit for four years uh and there are three type i think uh you you can find yourself in three two situations if you are involved in brexit matters of course uh, what we say, uh, your day one readiness stress test, these are the people that says, okay, bring it on. I'm fully ready. Um, I'm ready to rumble. Uh, it's not a problem. Uh, I, I don't fear this. Uh, and after all this commotion, it's it's about time that this starts because that drags on too long. These are the people that are most uh, ready for that. Uh, what their uh, outtake is, because I think that Claire uh, mentioned it, uh, well, it was in a, in, a, in a call yesterday where which are ours that actually some people think that they are they are they are very ready and then they you know you 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 start asking a question that leads to another question and then you think oh that part we forget it about ah okay we still have 15 days to go so it's not bad to do a stress test to put yourself in front of the mirror and say that's what i think for myself but I, am i really ready for the day one and so that's that's the, the one so that these are the people that technically if something happens it's uh, bits and pieces that we, we, we where we can assist. Uh, finish line support. Finish line support is that you've done your assessment, you've done a part of implementation, but still work needs to be done. But whether it's uh, it's due to COVID or any other very important project that you had, still the deadline is there, whether it is an FTA or not. Brexit is a fact, so there will be compliance issues, there will be delays, there will be costs. You need to tackle them. Uh, that's the finish line support is making sure that uh, you you are ready. When, when the Brexit kicks in. So that's really important there. Uh, also to only focus on what matters uh, and just bring you to the to the finish line. And then you have the no time to lose. Uh, is the last resort or is that uh, pen perdu or lost cause? Uh, my mother, whenever I had to take exam, she offers me the uh, medaille de Saint Rita. Uh, Saint Rita is for the lost cause before I get to get an exam. And that's a real thing. Uh, that's a real thing. So there, it might be the Saint Rita approach where the lost cause. But uh, we don't think so with uh, with Claire. We, we have done lots of projects where, where we could use the data of the companies. And if you only have like 15 days and you are well aware that you need a VAT number and an ERI number, how to safeguard your, your, your business in the UK, you know what? Take your data, uh, you do an analysis. We've done plenty of those analysis. You only take a Pareto approach, 2080, 20% of the client represent 80% of your business. And we're gonna focus on these ones either the supplier or the client. And we, we will make sure that this is at least a bit under control. You still get hurt, probably, but actually the majority of your business is, is nice and easy and is as the others. And this with only uh, 15 days. If you don't have a VAT number and a URI number, then actually I would, I would advise you to start for contingency plan because actually the UK is slow in responding. It's not always easy to get a VAT uh, number like this. 
So actually, we need to think about uh, alternatives. But in any case, know yourself is my message. So that's that's really important. Know know where you are, and 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 I would say act consistently. I don't know, uh, Claire, um, give you the the final word on the on the on the session because we are co-hosting this. Um, what do you think? The last let's say the last takeaway for 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 the people if we don't hear them before uh, before Brexit is a fact. Well, I think it's never too late to take action. <laughs> So um, I, I think that's the most important uh, takeaway that uh, even if to date you have not done anything, you, okay, there is not plenty of time, but you can still do something about it. Um, but I think yeah, it brings us indeed to the end of the, the, the session. And I would like to thank you, of course, Leo. I would like to thank Mark. I would like to thank Nadia. Uh, and also a very big thank you to, to everybody behind the screens like Ingrid, like Justine, because without them, we would never be able to do this. So a big thank you to, to those two ladies as well. And then, of course, a big thank you to, to all our participants, because once again, this uh, format uh, turned out to be a great one. Uh, so thanks for that suggestion, Leo, because you came up with that great idea. So it's 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 really appreciated by by clients. So thanks a lot for all your feedback. Keep following us on LinkedIn. Keep following us on on our website. We're still um, publishing. Um, on, on our website, new things on a, on a continuous basis. We're still in the process of recording further podcasts. So there are all already four podcasts on our website. So keep following us, keep watching us. And uh, I think I also want to wish you a very nice Christmas holidays, a very deserved ones, everybody, and hope that we see or speak each other in the next year. Thank you. Bye. Bye, all. Bye-bye.